Blake, it's always a pleasure for me to be with the Cousins Brothers in your pursuit of the truth. Good to be with you, Brian. And I got Dr. J with us, and we got some questions for you. Let's just get to it. If the Incas didn't build these megalithic structures, who did? Well, Blake, the Inca could not have built the megalithic structures because they were a Bronze Age people. And the stone that was cut and shaped is much harder than bronze. The basic principle you have to work with is that your tool has to be harder than the material you're cutting. And therefore, it's clear, also based on weathering, that these megalithic structures are much older than the Inca civilization and had to have been made by a very advanced technological civilization. The only options I think we have are either the so-called Atlanteans or extraterrestrials. You mentioned high technology a few times in your videos. Can I ask you what your theories are of some of the tools that were involved in making these mega structures? The tools used to make the megalithic structures in the highlands of Peru have to, we have to assume that they were beyond our present capability in the 21st century. And so in Egypt, for example, we see evidence of saw and uh, drill technology, but in the highlands of Peru, it honestly appears as if this ancient civilization was able to change the molecular nature of the stone itself and turn it into almost like a marshmallow material temporarily. Historians and experts have their own theories on how old these megastructures really are. What's your thoughts on the true origin of their age? The age of the megalithic structures, we have to presume, are 12,000 plus years old. And this is based on the idea that um, there was a cataclysmic event or series of cataclysmic events that occurred on the planet about 12,000 years ago. And this is being backed up by science today. Ancient symbols carved into stone at an archaeological site in Turkey tell of a story of a devastating comet impact. Scientists were analyzing the mysterious symbols carved into stone pillars and evidence from carvings made on a pillar known as the vulture stone suggests that a swarm of comet fragments hit the earth in around 11,000 BC. This devastating event, which wiped out creatures such as the woolly mammoths, also helped spark the rise of civilization. Scientists have speculated for decades that a comet could have caused the sharp drop in temperature during the period known as the Younger Days. By interpreting the animals as astronomical symbols and using computer software to match their position to the patterns of stars, research dated the event to about 10,950 BC. It probably resulted from a breakup of a giant comet in the solar system. What's the importance of Gobleki Tepe found in Turkey now that it's discovered happens to be over 20,000 years old? Gobleki Tepe appears to uh, have been buried on purpose about 12,000 years ago. So its actual age is unknown, but obviously older than that. And what it makes it important is the fact that most civilizations are believed to be maximum 6,000 years old, such as in the Indus Valley. But now we have evidence of sophisticated cultural people existing at least 12,000 years ago. I wanna get your true thoughts, Brian. What could have caused these catastrophic events in the past? Was it possibly mother nature, earthquakes, a meteorite, or was there some kind of weapon that was used that we don't know about? My theory about the cataclysm is again that it happened about 12,000 years ago. It could have lasted as much or as long as 300 years and likely it was an emission of energy from galactic center that then crossed uh, the galactic plane, entered our solar system, blew up one of the planets uh, which created the asteroid belt, then went through the sun and shot plasma from the sun straight at the earth. This caused the immediate melting and ending of the last ice age very rapidly in possibly weeks. 
The sea levels of the Earth rose by 300 plus feet, putting pressure on the crust of the Earth. This would have triggered earthquakes and other terrible events to happen on our planet, would have wiped out all of the megafauna of, the, uh, of North America, wiped out most of humanity, and any advanced civilization also would have disappeared at this time, especially those that were close to the coast. This is where we come up with the concept of the ancient civilization of Atlantis being destroyed, according to Plato, about 12,000 years ago. What is the oldest megastructure or structures that you believe were not created by man, rather from some sort of ancient high technology? I think that the megalithic works that we see in the highlands of Peru, as well as Puma Punku and Tiwanaku in Bolivia, uh, the Great Pyramid System in Egypt, Baalbek in Lebanon, Petra in Jordan, and other structures in Turkey, Greece, and Italy are all at least 12,000 years old. I can't say how old they are, but I can tell you all of them, I believe, based on geological weathering, the fact that high technology was used, that all of these structures, which we think of as simply being enigmatic, are a minimum of 12,000 years old. Lately, Brian, you've been using the drone and getting unprecedented shots of these megalithic structures. How has it helped you in recent discoveries? The use of drones, or quadcopters as I prefer to call them, give you an uh, unprecedented view of the megalithic structures because you literally can see from a bird's eyes point of view. Also, you can scan the area to see if there are other structures in the area that you, uh, you can't see from the ground. And so it's a phenomenal new tool that is opening up uh, possibilities, explanations, and views that we never had before. Now, Brian, we're looking at this incredible geometric shape embedded in the side of the mountain. What could have made this? What was the tools behind it? Some people are saying it's a moon calendar. The site you're referring to is called Kiarumiok, which in the Inca language means the stones of the moon. But of course the Inca didn't make it. It had to have been made probably with advanced technology and the weathering on the stone surface shows us that it's incredibly ancient. Some people theorize that it was a moon calendar. Other people theorize that it was a solar calendar. Possibly it was both but uh, the local people themselves and academics have no explanation as to who made it, when, why, and what its original function was. The Inca probably used it as a ceremonial site, but they used all of the megalithic places as ceremonial sites. All right, Brian, what do you gotta say to the people of Peru today? in regards to your theories that the Incas, in fact, did not build these megalithic structures. It almost sounds like you want to rewrite the history books. Well, the great thing is that the, uh, the people of Peru, especially the guides at Machu Picchu, actually come up to me more and more as time goes on because of my YouTube channel. And they tell me, your theories are fascinating. It appears that our history here is much older than what we were taught in school. And so the Peruvian people are warming up to the concept that civilization in this little country, which is incredibly rich culturally, dates back a minimum of 12,000 years and employed lost ancient high technology way, way in the distant past. Academics don't accept this, but the people are starting to understand, which is phenomenal. Tell me about your recent trip back to Pumapunku and the H-blocks and the anomalies in regards to your compass readings. Pumapunku in Bolivia is becoming more and more interesting and enigmatic because there are two types of stone there. Red sandstone, which is neutral as regards magnetism, and then the gray andesite, which is magnetic. But the interesting thing is the magnetism of the H-blocks, for example, which are made of the gray andesite, it's not an even magnetism uh, difference that we find, but it depends on the surface that you're scanning. So what Dr. Ken is showing you now is the natural magnetism of the area. And then when he comes close to the stone, again, 
about a 180 degree change. And here are some of the magnetic anomalies that we are studying. This is in the center of one of the H blocks. Notice the compass moves 180 degrees and then 90 degrees more and then becomes somewhat erratic. So no one understands fully what is going on with the magnetism here. It's not simply the fact that the stone contains magnetite. It means that the magnetism has been altered. Possibly it relates to the shapes of the H-blocks and other stones themselves. And then here we have Dr. Ken on the stone that has the groove in it with the holes. Again, notice what happens to the compass needle. Absolutely amazing. So that's my present study, is to try to correlate the relationship between the shaping of the stone, magnetism, and the incredible flat surfaces that we encounter at Pumapunku, which again, most academics believe were made by the Tiwanaku civilization 2,000 to 1,000 years ago. But it's clear whoever created Pumapunku had very advanced, lost, ancient, high technology. Now, Brian, this is my final question for you. And again, this is a personal question. In your own gut, what is your belief of how these ancient structures were created? Do you think that we as humanity created them or do you think that they were created by extraterrestrials or non-terrestrial beings that did not originate from this earth? Again, the fact that uh, many of the megalithic structures, if not all of them, in the highlands of Peru and Bolivia were made using very advanced technology, uh, in some cases technology we don't have in the 21st century, tells me quite strongly that again there was possibly uh, a very advanced human uh, civilization that, that did it or it was extraterrestrial in nature. Now, I'm beginning to think less and less that it was done by an advanced human uh, civilization because we would have to see cultural development. We don't see that. So either the human civilization were, uh, was destroyed by ancient cataclysmic events 12,000 years ago, or that extraterrestrials were here at that time and they constructed these megalithic structures in Peru, Bolivia, and other parts of the world. Brian, it's been an incredible adventure with you. Thanks for joining us right here at Third Phase Moon. You keep in touch and let us know if you find any more discoveries in the areas that you visit, man. It's always a pleasure for me to work with the Cousins Brothers, and uh, I'd love to uh, get back in contact with you to discuss the, my recent findings on Easter Island, evidence of lost ancient high technology, as well as future discoveries in February in uh, Mexico and April in Egypt, Lebanon and Jordan and beyond. Aloha to you and all of your audience from me here in Paracas, Peru. And also thank you Dr. J for joining us right here. Blake, it's always a pleasure to be on and thanks again. Everybody from around the world who just watched this, appreciate your support right here at Third Phase of Moon. Keep your eyes on the skies. We're not alone. We'll see you again next time. The best way to observe the island of course is by a quadcopter. And in this case, it's little Horus, my smallest of three quadcopters, very transportable and collapsible. And this gives you a sense of the landscape around Moon Island. You see ancient agricultural terraces of the Inca time period. And the island of the moon was specifically a place for the chosen women uh, of the Inca. They were the highest level of femininity in the Inca civilization. And this was their refuge, or I guess almost the equivalent of a nunnery or convent. But uh, in the Inca concept, women had as high a place in the civilization as men. And so this site has been largely reconstructed. And you can see its composition is actually quite simple. It's a rough hewn stone with clay mortar 
and then the clay mortar is used to cover the surfaces in order to give the uh, the buildings a very pleasant appearance. They're the standard looking trapezoidal shapes that you find at many Inca structures. And now pulling back once again you see that almost the entire island at one time was terraced and I don't know how many of these chosen women lived here, probably several hundred. And then this gives detail of the archaeological site, <coughs> probably destroyed by the Spanish at, uh, in the 16th century. And uh, this area is now being restored rather slowly. And then this gives you a view of the quadcopter going out to have a look at Lake Titicaca. If you look very carefully, you can see the Andes in the background on the left-hand side. Others are covered in cloud because it's snowing at this point. And here again, we see the very, again, quite simple construction of the Inca complex. And not that many tourists visit the Island of the Moon as compared to the Island of the Sun, but it's well worth it if you are in the area of Lake Titicaca. And as a little bonus, here we are at the Island of the Sun, which is much, much larger and quite close by. And this is a view of one of the Inca Sun Temples. Again, not a sophisticated structure. It would still be quite complex in terms of the number of people required to build it. But uh, remember that all of the complex polygonal work that you see in the city of Cusco is pre-Inca. This is what an actual Inca structure looks like. And finally, I'll soon be making a video about this site near Lake Titicaca called Kenawani. It's unknown what civilization or culture created it. You've been taking us all around the world from Peru, now we're in Egypt, and we're gonna be uh, case filing the Sphinx here. And the Sphinx has many mysteries. People wonder if there are uh, basically chambers within the Sphinx itself or possibly underneath it. If you had a excavation license and you were greenlit, ready to go, where would you start and why in relation to the Sphinx? I would explore the area in in uh, in front of the the paws of the Great Sphinx. Yeah, we see that you were explaining in the video that there is some kind of boardwalk, uh, possibly to mask what's really underneath there. What what's your thoughts? Yeah, that's what's really interesting, and that's the information you get when you're actually in Egypt. What I found out is that Dr. Robert Schock, who was the geologist able to date the Sphinx at being at least 12,000 years old, they did ground penetrating radar and they found at least one chamber existed underneath the, uh, the front paws of the Sphinx. So when he left, Zahi Hawass and the Egyptologists decided to start doing excavations very late at night and they supposedly were able to find and uh, excavate this chamber and that's why the boardwalk has been put over top of it to hide the fact that they've already done the excavation. So you're saying that history has been written. They're not letting us know exactly what's going on. Was this a, the present day government? This was um, during the time of Mubarak. So probably the 1990s um, when there was extreme cover up going on in Egypt. Um, but again, it's from local knowledge that you learn certain things like the boardwalk you're standing on was put in place to hide a secret excavation um, in search of the Hall of Records. Tell us a little bit more about the Hall of Records. Okay, the Hall of Records, I believe, was first described by uh, Edgar Cayce, who was a clairvoyant, very famous uh, um, American. And he stated that there was um, a hall of records underneath the front paws of the Sphinx that contained ancient information, possibly carved on gold or other uh, metallic tablets, talking about the true history of humanity. So you're saying somebody 
has possession of these incredible artifacts, information? Well, we do know, thanks to Robert Schock, that there is at least one chamber underneath the Great Paws of the Sphinx, and that it, it has been excavated, and any artifacts, um, if they existed, would have been removed. We also know that there's a, a huge series of tunnels under the Giza Plateau that go from north uh, to south and east to west. And where could they possibly lead? It just goes on and on, the mysteries of Egypt and the Sphinx itself. There are these photos of photographic historic evidence of what appears to be some kind of like manhole on the top of the Sphinx's head itself. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, there are actually some old photographs of, um, of a man standing inside of it. Um, it's been covered in concrete since that time so it's uh we're not sure if it's actually an entrance to the hollow core of the sphinx or if it's simply a depression in the top that's something that would require something like a drone or a quadcopter to fly over and see yeah and they're not allowing any uh, drone flights over there i take not at all okay the yeah so who really is in charge of uh, this you know historic amazing you know, location and are, is the government over there doing any kind of new exploration or excavation of the, of the area? Yeah. Since uh, Zahi Hawass was basically kicked out because of corruption and other things, um, alleged, uh, in, I think in the last two years, there's a new ministry of antiquities who's actually much more open-minded and he's opening up sites that have previously been prohibited to, uh, the general public. Well, that's, uh, at least the access is opening up now. So basically, who really built the Sphinx, in your opinion? A lot of people are giving the pharaohs the credit. Well, we do know, thanks to uh, geologists, there are actually 200 of them around the world that have confirmed that the vertical weathering on the Sphinx had to have been done by precipitation. So extensive rain over hundreds if not thousands of years and the last time the climate in that area uh, would have been that wet uh, would be at least 10,000 years ago so that's twice the age of the dynastic Egyptian or pharaonic culture but whether it's 12,000 or 20,000 or 30,000 uh, will re require more geological analysis um, but we, we do know that whatever culture did this had to have high technology of some kind because the area where the Sphinx is is called the Sphinx Enclosure and all the stone that was removed to reveal the Sphinx is right in front of it, which is the Sphinx Temple. And uh, there you have multi-ton blocks, some 40 tons or more in size. Most Egyptologists believe that the Sphinx is probably about 4,500 years old and is contemporary with the construction of the Great Pyramid. But again, uh, they're speculating, whereas the geological evidence is proving that it has to be at least 10,000 years old. Could you describe to us what you would visually see if you would step back in time 12,000 or to, you know, 10,000 years ago and describe what the Sphinx would have looked like in its completion back then? Well, it probably looked like a lion. Uh, we do know that the face has been recarved at least one, if not two times. And uh, throughout its history, it's been buried in sand up to its neck. And so the erosion on the surface of the body is much more extensive than on the face. And that proves that the face has been recarved, probably in dynastic times. And the face is completely out of proportion with the body. So originally, most, uh, most experts I know believe that the Sphinx was in the shape of a lion and its eyes were pointing towards the star Sirius. What an amazing sight that would uh, be. Brian Forrester, keep up uh, your amazing adventures around the world. Uh, we look forward to have you back next week. And we've got some questions for you. And if anybody wants to uh, have a question for Brian, please leave it in the comments below. And whatever comment gets the most thumbs up will uh, bring that over to Brian Forrester. Thanks for uh, joining us and be sure to check the link out to Brian's YouTube channel. He's uh, posting pretty much, I don't know, how often are you posting, Brian? Uh, about every four days, so not as much as you guys.
<laughs> oh, oh wow but you are uh you're on location it's quite incredible and thanks for sharing brian take care and be safe always a pleasure aloha and underneath the pause also what we can see up here is uh evidence that um the officials were drilling into the bedrock in order to see if there was an underground chamber. But have a look at the locations of where the actual drill holes are. So this is about halfway down the body of the Sphinx. And you can see these caps are on top of uh, angle drilling, core drilling. I believe in the 90s or perhaps after that in order to see if there are holes or chambers or tunnels under the Sphinx as we round the basically the elbow and here we have another one and here we have another one but again, what's curious is the transition between the bedrock here <clears throat> and these obvious blocks which were set into place. They're, they're basically at ground level. So do they represent a cover over top of the chamber? And is the front access to the Sphinx, in fact, right in this area here, covered by the boardwalk? Because again, when we go to this side, the bedrock is there, the slabs are here, continuing all the way to the end of the other paw, where again we have the bedrock. So if you're interested in joining us in Peru and Bolivia, we have three tours for you in 2019. The Inti Raimi Inca Celebration of the Sun, there are seven spaces left on that tour. Then in August, we have the Elongated Skulls of Peru tour, which involves going to the coast and the highlands of Peru. And also, we're going to Turkey in September of 2019. Very excited about that. And finally, in November 2019, the Serpentine Mysteries tour of Peru and Bolivia. Thank you. Mm -hmm.